So uh, just briefly, uh, I'm Rob Esker. I'm uh, responsible for our product and strategy on open infrastructure, open ecosystem, as we refer to it at NetApp, which has which you know is an ever-changing set of projects um, with the the dynamic ecosystem that exists around open source, and predominantly the way we look at it as as it applies to storage and data management. So if you're not already familiar with NetApp, that's what we do. Um, you know, historically, you might think of us as a uh, a provider of the filer, variously referred to as the filer. But increasingly, we have multiple platforms. And, and we're in a multi-year journey in moving away from strictly the delivery of our, what we do that's interesting and useful to you uh, in the form factor of a filer, in the form factor of appliance, and increasingly to any number of other scenarios, which might mean hosted at one of several cloud endpoints. But that's what I'm done. I, I do at NetApp. Um, I'm also uh, sit on the governing board of the CNCF, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, home of Kubernetes amongst a variety of other projects, Prometheus and some of the other ones you may have heard heard of. And I've also, on my third year, on the OpenStack Foundation board as well. So, oh no, we're gonna start with that. <laughs> yes, we are. So so the, the um, apologies, I had some demo content. It's actually in our booth. Uh, I was updating uh, on the plane that did not go well uh, for reasons that uh, I'd be happy to share with off camera. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, I was able, unable to live stream across the connection that we have here. But so the demo content I'm gonna refer, and I'd be happy to walk you through it at our booth, but uh, I'll give you the, the conceptual stuff and, and uh, you know, kind of the backdrop. It's actually really what I wanna do is establish, well, who are we, what are we doing, why are we doing it, and then get into a little bit of the specifics. So angry unicorn notwithstanding. Um, can, the focus, this being DockerCon, uh, is containers. So the backdrop is, of course, things are changing fast, uh, increasingly fast. Um, we, you know, it's part of this, this whole digital transformation that we hear about. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that um, no matter which the source, no matter which analyst, no matter which pundit, uh, in, the consistent chorus is that the data is part is central to the to the digital transformation that's underway, um, and it's becoming outsized. You know, I, I apologize; I don't have the actual reference for it, um, but data as the new currency is the mantra, uh, and you know, more so in proportion to the to the rest of infrastructure, and indeed, even maybe your application logic specifically, although not necessarily the functions derived from it. Um, uh, oh, as we pass, as we proceed into time. And so folks like 451 will tell you that if you have a, a data-driven sort of model that your market valuation is dramatically higher than other businesses. And so what does that mean? Well, um, you, you need to make sure that as a digitally transformed company, you're considering what it, how you hold data, uh, where it sits, the forms of data that exist, you know, they are increasingly distributed, dynamic, and diverse. Uh, and that means you need a approach that accounts for the security, the efficiency, uh, your path forward, and whether or not it's open across multiple interfaces. Um, uh, and that's what NetApp's doing. We're building what we call a data fabric. Uh, and so this is mostly in its current form, a set of technologies that, um, allow you to place the right data in the right place in the most efficient and secure means possible. So if you go back to, if you're already familiar with NetApp, like some of our replication technology, which we, we brand in the market SnapMirror, it allows you in a way that's opaque to, to the application layers above to move the data in the most uh, network utilization efficient manner possible to the right place. But there's also a bunch of caching technologies and a, a variety of other capabilities that facilitate this. How do you do this? Well, we can stand up endpoints at all of the large, quote unquote, hyperscale clouds. So on tap is what most people historically associate with, with NetApp, with that filer. On tap's the operating system that exists on it. So you can stand up an on tap instance at EC2. Now, for example, you could stand up an ONTAP instance in close relationship to EC2 if indeed you want to actually hold that data somewhat more secure. Um, uh, so this is what we call NetApp private um, 
kind of private storage for EC2, but it's not just them. We're, we're working with others like the Azures and, and other hyperscale uh, cloud providers. And you'll see more announcements going forward. In fact, one of the things we just announced was a NFS as a service partnership with um, Azure. So, so Azure's NFS as a service capability in the future, just announced a week and a half ago, is actually powered under the hood by this data, these set of data fabric capabilities. Is that similar to some other um, vendors that offer um, sort of storage as a service in a data center that's very close to the Azure or AWS data centers? So it, there, there's a, a variety, sort of a pick your poison if you prefer. Perhaps marketing guys wouldn't, wouldn't appreciate if I called it poison, but um, take <laughs> horses for courses perhaps. Uh, there is the opportunity to actually stand up a, a, a traditional uh, system in which you can get deterministic performance and you have like security provided for uh, where you're not necessarily relying upon uh, like, you know, frankly, Azure or Microsoft in this case to, to hold that secure. You're, you're, you, don't, you don't want to necessarily rely upon them uh, for, for the entirety of that sort of model. You can actually hold it external and we can establish low latency connections via, via a private uh, essentially a VPC of sorts, I know that's not the Azure terminology, uh, to, to the Azure Compute Cloud. Uh, that's one model. Another is you can actually stand up on tap the instance itself as, or as an instance within that cloud relative to all of your other com you know, application instances. Um, uh, there's, and then the other th the thing I just mentioned is none of the above. It's actually yet another service that you can interact with in the in the model of any other Azure service. So give me, you know, not block storage in, in a way that's abstract, uh, you know, to me. I don't know necessarily the implementation details. I'm just going to tell you what how much of it I want at what particular quality, uh, perhaps on an IOPS boundary or whatever. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to do that with NFS. And so the 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 heavy lifting under the hood is actually done by um, on top in this case. Uh, but likewise, uh, there's some orchestration uh, that we've built that allow you to render that in a service and as a service and scalable as a service model. So there's, hence the pick your poison. It depends on what you need and what you want. Uh, you can choose to, to handle the entire activity administratively if you want. Uh, you can, uh, on your own gear relative to it, you can handle it uh, on, on their cloud, but administratively you still own that task and there may be good reasons for it. Or you can say, look, I don't want any of the, the mess associated with that. I just want the capability to deliver to my compute instances. Okay. So what's this, so the, the data fabric, um, that my intent in covering that is just to kind of understand the backdrop for how we look at containers. So one of the things that we're really excited about are the container image format is inherently portable. So it goes a long way towards that sort of age old promise of write once, run anywhere. You know, unless you want to deploy in like ARM processors or something like that, you know. <laughs> write once, run anywhere, x86 perhaps is what we should say. Um, but, but the point is, is that um, if you're building a set of technologies that facilitate write once, run anywhere, it meshes very well with, with um, the set of capabilities NetApp can deliver in terms of placing data in the right place at the right time in, in a secure and efficient and cost-effective model manner. So sure, uh, a cloud native application that might interact strictly with objects you know, is able to traverse any number of different sort of, so long as HTTP is available, you know, you know uh, uh, holes are poked through that allow you to get to something via HTTP, that's great, uh, you can get you know, to your data, any number of other locales, but that doesn't necessarily appropriate for certain workload capabilities or s style of CS problems. You know, there's certain types of things where you may need more of a transactional I.O. Uh, model, and frankly, you wouldn't do that with an object store. Um, uh, and perhaps you want something that uh, actually has arbitrated access to common storage, you know, multiple writers that, you know, that might not sound like a shared file system, but that's what one of the things a shared file system could do for you. So this data fabric sort of objective, this vision, and it's a set of technologies we're building towards. I'm not, I'm not saying to you, you know, go, go to NetApp and, you know, give me one of those data fabrics. Um, it's, it's really a common vision across um, the entirety of our development effort and across our portfolio that we're trying to march towards to make it a, a coherent capability. It's, it's not yet fully realized. 
So I'm not going to bother you with what's driving container adoption, but lots of things. Uh, it depends on how you want to look at it, what your motivation is. If you're looking at like the alignment to, to traditional sort of um, infrastructure buying, um, you're going to look at it different ways. These, all of these qualities represent a massive explosion. This is hardly the, the context or audience I would think I'd need to convince of the explosion of containers. But you know, the point is it's happening, it's underway. That said, it's not yet happening in all of the, the corners of traditional enterprise, in particular where um, you have monoliths that, that have been built and are being maintained by more traditional IT um, organizations. Uh, and I think there's probably a progression towards that. And we'll talk a little bit about it and how we think we can help solve some of those problems. But some of the, the um, qualities of containers, even if not, even if you can't afford to re-render in its entirety your monolith into you know, cloud native and microservices oriented, uh, you can still derive some of those, those benefits from containerization uh, in incremental fashion. You know, perhaps it's, it means take that monolith and start building, you know, additional net new capabilities around it in terms, in, in terms of, in, in the form of microservices that sort of orbit it. Uh, and then over time, you, you can decommission old, old functions, old components of that monolith, and you end up with a micro, uh, microservices oriented uh, delivery. Um, and, okay, but why would you do that? Because you can make that monolith portable today. Now, this sometimes, Folks will 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 look, will look at me aghast. My my God, that you know that's not you know that's that's not necessarily uh, the ideal scenario. I, I want to contemplate containers only in sort of a purest fashion. But we've seen plenty of folks that say, well, I need to actually deliver you know commercial software or otherwise in a variety of different endpoints, and I can't necessarily always account for like qualifying or. Um, uh, you know, arranging for the specifics of each of, the, of those different locales infrastructure. So I'm just going to assume that sort of common runtime, which is the container, container environment, the container ecosystem. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I don't know much about NetApp yet. I think mm -hmm. I'm starting to get a picture, but we have, we have a big monolithic application in Windows, and it would be interesting to see it running in a container um, at some point, to your point. Where would your offering come in? So, so our offering, is, I'll, I'll talk about what specifically we do, but we are very much the storage and data management layer um, underneath the container engine, underneath the container orchestration engine. So if it's the case that the, the monolith or the, the existing Windows-based application, it probably desires to interact with persistence, with storage in, in either a, a, you know, a, a POSIX file system. Sorry, say again. Okay, okay. So in that case, uh, we wouldn't be delivering SQL, but we would underpin SQL. Um, so we would, we would provide the uh, underlying um, infrastructure to make SQL reliable and performant and efficient. Um, so SQL... Well, like on top of a SAM or...? Yeah, right. Um, it, it, we, basically, what are, what are our endpoints, what are on tap, and I, I should mention there are other parts of our portfolio. So SolidFire is another product, Ether is another product. We have an object store called Storage Web Scale. Ultimately, they're all storage endpoints. You know, you interact with it in a block file or object manner. And um, we, we play cool tricks with efficiency, with replication, with caching, with you know, performance, quality of assurance, yeah. um, quality of service, rather, is what I meant to say, um, at that layer. So SQL would sit atop us. If you need to interact with a block store, we would provide the block store. If you need to interact with a file system, we would provide it, albeit in a advantaged manner. So this is one of those concepts that I think we can lose sight of why we do it. So a container is, by design, an ephemeral thing. So when we, we install something like Microsoft SQL on top, then we, Microsoft SQL is not an ephemeral workload. So how does, how specifically does that persistent layer of storage help solve that problem? So if I want to go to an operations model that I'm deploying all of my apps and containers and I can, and, and 
because I just like the operate operations model, but the data itself needs to be persistent. When I kill the when I when I kill the the container, and that OS instance goes away, how does my data remain? So that that that's I think that's one. Of yeah, the the truth it turns out there's no magic. You you must have persisted the data somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're we're active. I haven't got to that yet, but we're active in the Docker container engine uh, space in in Kubernetes in particular. Uh, for, for container orchestration, although not confined to those, uh, to try and, within a community context, certainly it's not in NetApp alone, uh, build a sophisticated persistence model for containers. In fact, if you're familiar, and this is, uh, you, perhaps you're familiar with CRI, con uh, Container Runtime Interface, mm -hmm. or perhaps uh, CNI, Container Net uh, Networking Interface, it's a, an attempt to build a common model for runtime and and networking across the the, the frankly significant number of disparate sort of cont uh, containers oriented projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the world really probably doesn't need two dozen of something, uh, maybe a few. Uh, and, but can we have a common way of interacting with networking? Can we have a common way of interacting with, with, um, with you know, the container engine itself at the runtime? Well, the same thing's happening with storage called container storage interface, unsurprisingly, CSI. That's a working group as part of the, the storage SIG in, in Kubernetes. But uh, there's, there's the involvement from the other orchestration engines, from the other container engines that want to adopt this as well. Now, it's not as far along as CNI and CRI, but the intent there is to make sure that um, you, you can uh, assume synonymous with containers that you have a way uh, and ideally a common way to, to persist data in, in a sophisticated way where I can perhaps establish certain policies associated with perhaps protection or durability, um, performance, assurance. So in theory, the, because we're not that far along yet, but in theory, I could have container APIs that say, you know what, uh, as part of this creation, create a persistent volume whether that volume is an object or uh, a set of object or a NFS, some block storage, or wh whatever the underlying storage layer is, create it or attach to that. So the, as the machine state goes up and down, that persistent layer of, of storage is abstracted away. We just haven't developed a way to, to we have provi provided that created that standard yet within the container? That's the, the standard correct portion of it's correct. However, there in the here and now you can do this, mm -hmm. albeit the manner in which you do it differs a little bit from one uh, particular deployment model to another. So like if I'm in, if I, you know, if I'm using uh, Docker alone, perhaps with Swarm, uh, you know, it's all uh, contingent upon the use of the NetApp, I'm sorry, the Docker volume plugin interface. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Kubernetes space, there's a persistent notion of a persistent volume claim or flexible volumes. In fact, frankly, there's more than one way to skin the proverbial cat in Kubernetes. So the point is, no, in a standardized way across everything, that's not yet accomplished. That's what I was describing. I guess in terms of order operations, I failed to mention you can do real work today now. Uh, and in fact, I'll talk a little bit about what we enable. So the, from a future perspective, once there are standards, with something like ONTAP, I can say from a developer's perspective, the developer then is, you, we can expose a service like Snap to the developer so that can be part of his application as he builds the application itself. Today, that's not really a, a practical part of the, like there's no CN, C, C, what was this? container network storage, yeah, means container like storage C, network, C, right. CSI, CNI, that's gonna be a storage format when it finally lands and everyone agrees and implements it. But I guess, is what you're doing quite similar to Rexray? Yeah, so Rexray is an approach that um, from, a, a, frankly, a large a traditional competitor, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Dell EMC, uh, that, that provides uh, persistence, for, in particular, I, I'm not an expert on Rexray, but as I understand it, predominantly aimed at uh, at Docker and at Kubernetes. Right. Um, so we have equivalents to that. However, and, and so I was going to talk a little bit about them. 
Um, but frankly, what, we, what we'd really like to do is not have to deliver you something that's NetApp specific. You know, the things that we have that are equivalent to Rexray yeah. um, are, there's a project called Trident, and then of course in the Docker only context, there, you can go to the Docker Hub, Docker Store right now and get the NetApp Docker volume plugin. Um, and that works, just works with Swarm. It also just works with, with uh, Mesos if you, if you so, so choose to use that. Um, but we'd rather actually like take the ability, uh, you know, sort of that intermediary connection, the intermediary software, and w which implements a particular model on construct for storage and push that into the upstream communities. Because you talked about a developer like being able to expect that. Well, you, you could today, within the places that you've arranged for something like a Rexray or a Trident to exist, expect that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you can go anywhere a container exists. Uh, you're, you are limited in your portability. And so we want to make, sh make these qualities synonymous with container frameworks overall. So long-winded way of saying, yes, it's very similar to Rexray in its current incarnation. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, actually in a sort of oblique way, we kind of covered what I was saying. Look, there is sort of the 12-factor application sort of model uh, you know, the folklore around, you know, what is and isn't a cloud native application so seems to have sort of evolved towards, well, uh, you know, you don't ever persist anything, you know, except for in an object. But the reality of it is I just talked about how the world is increasingly data centric and you must have persisted it somewhere in a database in an object. And, and frankly, there are styles of, of, you know, CS problems that lend themselves more towards what a block device or what a a shared file system would would provide to you, um, you know, and, and of course it comes with, with it's a it's a pro and con argument as to what what's most appropriate. Um, but we're seeing increasingly, especially for folks that need to bring existing business or application logic forward, rather than you know contemplating from ground zero what it would mean to exist in a cloud native way, you know, it tends to be pragmatic to take. The, the value of that existing business or application logic, which seeks to interact with a POSIX file system or a block device and carry it forward and then and make sure that there's just a way in that container framework to interact with those devices. By the way, if you do just want to persist everything in objects, well, we're happy to talk to you about that as well. <laughs> we have a product called Storage Grid Web Scale that's that precisely, yeah. Do, do you resolve to DNS as well? I know some of the like open source offerings like Minio and you resolve to IP addresses. Whereas when you create a bucket in Amazon, you're always assigning a DNS entry at the same time. Right. It's a good question, and I simply don't know the answer to it. Um, happy yeah, to get back to you. Do you have a, uh, like a free-to-use model? Is it just based on? Uh, no, it is not uh, a free-to-use. Uh, there's not a free-to-use licensing. Um, it's essentially, I'm going to either host or more likely on-prem build a... Um, an equivalent S3, uh, and you might do so because it, it, our capability evolved in sort of um, sort of terse regulatory environments, particularly like around HIPAA, you know, financial services, uh, and so it has a bunch of accommodation for those types of capabilities. Uh, but despite the name WebScale, that's actually not its heritage. It, it, it moved towards being able to provide those capabilities later on in its life cycle. In terms of having a free to use, free to start, freemium type capability, it's not something we've we've availed just yet. And I'm I'm also not an expert on storage or web scale, but I'll happy to get you the answer to your, your question. So about those available integrations, and since you do know are you, is anyone else here familiar with Rexray? Okay. Um, so I was gonna say that um, this is very much in the model of it. So the, the, the primary three things that exist today for interacting with shared file systems or block devices with NetApp's portfolio, whether it's our Solidfire ONTAP or E-Series systems, is via either the NetApp Docker volume plugin. Uh, again, you can go to the Docker store right now. It's Docker certified. Um, it does work with Swarm. It works with Mesos just without any modification. Uh, in the Kubernetes context, we can actually have what's uh, referred to as an external um, dynamic storage provisioner, uh, and that operates in a model very similar to Rexray. Um, I, I think we would prefer to actually just collaborate with that Rexray community in the upstream Kubernetes rather than necessarily um, have, 
have an external project. Uh, our project is also Apache 2.0. You can use it. You can implement support for other systems. Um, but um, uh, I think the right place to make it synonymous over time is to, to land something like this into the upstream. And it does actually provide what are called storage classes so that you can select from, if you prefer, abstract sort of um, uh, you know, a marketplace storage. It's up to, up to you how you want to define it. But, you know, perhaps you want to provide for a certain set of capabilities something you might call premium, uh, and it has you know IOPS or or certain values of of, of uh, deterministic performance um, uh, associated with it, and you can select from that as, when you were requesting persistent volumes. Hey, give me persistent volume of type premium. Now it's up to you to define what premium looks like, but this is a way you can access, you know, like your commodity tier, which is perhaps low or no cost, uh, and differentiate it from the things that you might underpin your 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 perhaps mission critical SQL database with. And then the other thing that we also see, which is kind of interesting, is uh, folks that are have OpenStack deployed or seek to actually use some of the reuse some of the components of OpenStack. So Cinder has existed. Uh, it's a block storage service. Um, there's an equivalent capability called Manila, shared file system as a service. Um, and they're relatively mature. Uh, and uh, I think in the case of Cinder, there's something like 90 separate uh, block storage backends across the entirety of the you know, industry, frankly, um, both open source and commercial. Uh, that are provided for. And so the question is, well, can I just use Cinder standalone from the rest of OpenStack and, and use that to, to you know, provide pers persistent volumes? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, we did some of the work to actually make Cinder and Manila modularly independent and wrote um, uh, flex volume uh, uh, capabilities in Kubernetes to actually just to, to work with that. So we see a bit of that. It's most commonly used where I need to provide infrastructure as a service for bare metal and for VMs and for containers. And so we, so why not just use a kind of common storage uh, provisioning plane? A little bit more detail. I think I already talked about this with NetApp Docker Volume plugin, where I think what, maybe the first or thereabouts to have actually uh, landed this uh, and actually to get it up on the, the Docker Hub and Docker Store. Um, it, it supports uh, the entirety of our portfolio and likewise all of them simultaneously. Uh, the Docker volume plugin is sort of unsurprisingly just provides uh, common persistence to containers as orchestrated by the engine and, and the NDVP component. The, uh, by the way, all of the work I'm describing, every bit of it, NDVP, Trident, and the Cinder stuff uh, is in the upstream. None of this is NetApp proprietary. Of, with the exception, of course, the implementation against our platforms. But there's nothing to say you couldn't reuse it for another platform. Is there a question? Um, so it's like the connectors and the volumes there. And then you add your access key or your license, right? Uh, right. Once deployed. Right, correct. It's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's actually, there's not necessarily a, a massive amount of sort of, you know, New, new sort of capability here. This is in, in, in many ways taking like the ability to access uh, uh, and distinguish storage capabilities, like in a maybe what you're already familiar with in a VM-centric world, and doing the same thing for containers. And these are just the mechanisms for doing so. Is that managed with proprietary NetApp uh, IP, or is that at the... Um of Kubernetes or yeah, so so we're we're not seeking to um, uh, manage any of it in a proprietary manner. So all of what I mentioned is already actually available either in the upstream uh, or actually independently in the in in the open. So for example, Trident and the NetApp Docker Volume plugin are under Apache 2.0. They are in NetApp's GitHub namespace. Um, uh, there's primarily a community of users. There's not necessarily a community of, of other vendors using the NAP Docker Volume plugin, uh, but it is certainly not, it's definitely not proprietary. And I mentioned that what we'd actually prefer to do, the game that we, you know, we're frankly playing, is trying to drive these capabilities into their upstream projects so that, that our, all of that software I just mentioned is entirely unnecessary. 
But we're not, no, we're not, we're not inserting proprietary components in the middle. So just the, the line there about the, um, the ability to differentiate storage, so the IOPS, et cetera. Yeah. That's managed upstream as well, is it? And that's just a call back to... Well, it's, impl it's implemented in the case of, for Kubernetes, Trident. So the Trident project uh, implements and delivers the storage. So, th so the construct, a storage class, is something that's understood at the Kubernetes layer. Okay, but the implementation of that of the storage class is handled by, and the management of it across a fleet of systems is handled by Trident. So there's a, a basically a scheduler that in which you have to actually. Uh, advertise the set of backend capabilities to it so they can under maintain a notion of where to place provisioning requests across it to appropriately do the, the sort of play the Tetris game with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the storage class request. So I want storage class premium. Well, which of these backend systems are, are equipped to actually service that request? That's implemented at the, at the Trident layer. And by the way, you know, I think at last count, there's something like 60 or more I think then the last count was 65, and it's about a month old. Um, uh, different either sort of outright distributions or um, sort of opinionated, uh, 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 opinionated sort of um, in, instantiations, if you will, for lack of a better term, probably not the right way of putting it, of Kubernetes in a managed service context. So you know, it's all Kubernetes, but lots of different sort of uh, takes on the concept. Um, I haven't seen like a lot of outright, I haven't seen outright forking necessarily within, without an intention to come back. But the point is, is that if you look at Kubernetes as, as um, uh, the place to implement a common storage model, a common sophisticated, uh, sophisticated persistence model, then you can assume that, that it, will, it will, all of those other separate 60 or more uh, derivations of it will eventually inherit that. And a good example of this is OpenShift. When it replatformed, so if you're not familiar with OpenShift, and it's OpenShift Origin is an op the open source project. OpenShift is the, the Red Hat uh, PaaS capability. Kind of, a, I met, he mentioned Pivotal earlier, sort of an equivalent to Pivotal of sorts. Uh, when OpenShift replatformed to, to Kubernetes, um, I believe last year, thereabouts, I don't recall the exact timeline, it just automatically inherited some of these storage capabilities of Kubernetes that we've been helping build within the community context. And so Trident just works with OpenShift as an example. Now we're, we're involved uh, primarily in the uh, CNCF in the storage seg within Kubernetes. Uh, we're, uh, we're very involved and have been since its inception in the OpenStack community, which is increasingly uh, dealing with a lot of well, two different things. What does it mean to actually deliver OpenStack itself in a containerized fashion, or separately, how to deliver a set of services to containers? Um, we're, we're very involved also in the Docker community, although, um, frankly, it's still a work in progress on trying to land some of the stuff that we're uh, into the upstream. For example, we, uh, we introduced, we, we provided a, um, a common snapshot and cloning capability. Uh, an enhancement that is still working its way through community processes to, to become more of a, to get merged and hopefully become a standard. <coughs> so, you know, this all falls in the backdrop of, you know, sort of my, my, uh, my um, remit, for lack of a better term, which is open ecosystem. So heavily involved in OpenStack, heavily involved in, uh, not so, uh, not quite as heavily involved in providing configuration, deployment management, or if you prefer, host management capabilities like Ansible and Puppet. We also have some Chef stuff that's out there in the open. Um, but you can see the Docker and Kubernetes where we're spending most of our time in the container space, but looking at, at branching out beyond that. So I uh, want to point you to netapp.io. So uh, this is what we refer to as the pub. It's uh, where we try to uh, direct folks um, who may have questions or may want to collaborate with us on any of those projects we, we refer to, as well as a, a variety of others we didn't cover. Uh, Slack channels are where, where my teams uh, mostly hang out. Uh, it's a great way to, um, to interact with us directly. I'd certainly love to take a look at your, your pull requests if, uh, if you have some in mind. Again, netapp.io. And uh, that's most of what I wanted to cover here at DockerCon, is what's NetApp up to and why, how we think about containers and where we hope to head with it. 
That was not under embargo so far, right? No, none of that's mm -hmm. embargo. Yeah. Good. It's on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Were you guys aware that NetApp was doing some of this stuff? And to what extent? Yes. Well, yeah, well, you've seen it. But I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, that, uh, for example, did you, did you all know that, that NetApp was doing so much work in terms of open source and Kubernetes and all this? No, I mean, well, for me, being the great NetApp uneducated, it's, it was just, you just know that storage vendors are way yeah. Yeah. I saw, but just there's bits of information. Well, I mean, if we remain just another storage vendor, uh, then we become commoditized into into non-relevance. Yeah. And so that's, you know, this has been quite a long while that we've been trying to move beyond that. Certainly, that's still a very relevant way to consume some of the, you know, what we, we, we deliver our value, how we deliver our value. But uh, we can't, can't remain confined to that or else the, uh, it won't end well. Yeah, precisely. So we can suggest the guys to check the field day 14 page yeah. where we have a representation from the guys from the pub who went in. Yeah, so do you, did you get that from uh, like a Kapil, Aurora, and Garrett yes. Mueller and yeah. stuff? Okay, cool. Yeah, the, the pub I started about six or seven years ago and as something else, and then it's funny how it's evolved into this uh, beer drinking, I'm sorry, a web publishing exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, and, and I think that that's actually rather interesting that, um, you know, NetApp, of course, is a storage company mm -hmm. and a traditional storage company is at that, but is definitely trying to do something, trying to move forward and, and contributing quite a lot in open source, which is perhaps not what people are aware of or thinking. So, uh, look, I, I might be misunderstanding this. But it seems like the way you're contributing to open source is shims onto your paid products. So it's kind of self-serving if that is the, the remit of it, and that, that would have to happen anyway. So there's, there's two, two thrusts. One, very obviously, is to make sure that if our platforms have some form of distinguishing quality that allow it to win in the marketplace, that it's not hidden by what are commonly abstractions to it in, in the various open source frameworks. For yes, clearly. That's an obvious uh, activity. Uh, the, the shim portion of it, uh, yeah, I guess you could, that's from a technical perspective, dependent upon which project we're referring to, ends up how they end up being implemented. Albeit we tend to uh, deliver those in the open source project itself, yeah. uh, which is useful for um, uh, the community of deployers and users in the sense that they can modify to taste in ways that frankly we most likely, in some ways that we wouldn't, uh, it also probably sustains the value of the investment beyond like the end of support we would del deliver. But that is not what it's confined to. Um, we, we also, for example, I'll use OpenStack as a good example. Um, so Cinder in the, in the beginning started as, uh, actually I won't take you through the entire <laughs> uh, litany of, of events, but you know, it started out as a fairly simplistic approximation of, of EBS. Um, indeed, there were EBS shims where you could actually say, I, I want you know, my on-prem EBS, so Cinder, Cinder would be it. Uh, so it didn't really have a notion, any, a more sophisticated notion of what storage systems could deliver you. And so we built in the notion of volume types. We built in and helped build within the community context the, a model for replication. We built in volume groups. We built in a variety of different capabilities. In fact. Uh, the project technical lead for Cinder and in its inception as a NetApp employee. Um, you know, we founded the Manila project. In fact, myself and another guy, the founder of the Manila project, which was uh, deliver shared file systems as a service. Now, why? Yeah, because NetApp does shared file systems really well. Um, but if uh, the world is only block and object of cloud uh, and, you know, there's some potential utility to it, then it would be advantageous for NetApp to, to make sure there was an open way to do so. So that wasn't strictly a shim against our backend systems. That was actually an entire project that contemplated how do I deliver shared or distributed file systems as a service. And that was, in, in the amount of code contribution that, that was necessary to do so, in term, measured in lines or commits or man hours, 
significantly exceeds the effort associated with the shims. Yeah, which it, which it would do, right? Because it's something that you're making available for people to use. But in terms of we have this product, you pay for licensing if you want to get involved with it, we've contributed a shim to a project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's kind of par for the course at the moment. That portion of it. Yeah, but you do need the skills, and it, it's a completely different world to your regular business, working in open source, isn't it? I mean, yeah. navigating it, the pull requests, the licensing, it's an art in itself. It is. So, so it definitely it's the case that uh, the, the shim activity, yeah. uh, as you referred to it, is a um, uh, price of admission. Yeah. Um, I mean, guess what I'm trying to say is, while that is absolutely something we're doing, uh, it is not confined to it. The work in the Kubernetes storage um, seg uh, is not in the form of, of, of a shim. Uh, that's, you know, and some of this stuff is also not always measured in lines of code. You know, some of this is measured in, in, in reviews and documentation and, you know, frankly, arguing in a room incessantly. Uh, so so we, we, we under, I think I understand where you're getting at, but I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that str the price of admission stuff is, this, is, this, is the only place we're playing. So if I understand correctly, not all the code that you produce, even if it's open source, is strictly related to its implementation with NetApp, but there are portions of code that can be used for the benefit of multiple uh, open source projects and not specific to NetApp itself, right? It, well, so let me give you an example with, with Manila. So Manila was never going to succeed as an open source project if it was only NetApp. Frankly, it wouldn't have been taken into the community. Um, so it was, you know, it's, it's, it was a fascinating set of conversations in the early days when I said, well, we're going to go do this inside of you know, NetApp's four walls. And what is this? Well, we're going to go enable this for every vendor that does shared or distributed file systems. You're going to do what? For who? Um, you know, after all, we are a, a publicly held corporation. <laughs> you know, so we're, we're, you know, there's a fiduciary sort of uh, uh, requirement there, deliver shareholder value. Well, we perceive that, um, to be clear, for, to meet our, our ultimate strategic objectives, which was to try and deliver the relevance of shared and distributed file systems, we would need to do so in a community context that provided broad support for everyone else in the industry. And so you look at both Cinder and Manila, um, again, I'm referring to OpenStack right now, but I think it's a, a good example. Uh, you, you have support amongst all of NetApp's traditional competitors, uh, tr traditional and, and current competitors. Um, and so that, the value of that work didn't just, didn't just benefit NetApp, but it benefited, I would say, anyone who wanted to consume that way and then, frankly, broader sense of the industry. But yes, to be clear, um, we're not doing it strictly out of altruism. Um, it, it, you know, there is a commercial sort of incentive or commercial sort of motivation behind what we're doing. Yeah, but still you're being able to create new use cases and therefore create a new market that benefit mostly you, but not only you. So end of the day, it's, you know, good for everybody. Hopefully so. <laughs>